and thank you for joining our event today. My name is Nat Cohan, and I'm the president of C2ES, the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Pricing Carbon Initiatives Fireside Chat with Representative Scott Peters. C2S has long supported market-based approaches to addressing climate change. And because we believe that carbon pricing is an enormously powerful tool to align profit incentives with a low carbon economy, to spur the development and deployment of new technologies, and to cut emissions at the pace and scale needed to meet the climate crisis. Since our founding over 20 years ago, we've worked with policymakers, business, and other stakeholders to advance carbon pricing efforts. And that's one reason we're particularly happy to have been a steering committee member of the Pricing Carbon Initiative since its founding about a decade ago, and why I'm so pleased to be hosting this webinar today. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today Representative Scott Peters. Uh, Congressman Peters represents California's 52nd congressional district, which includes the cities of Coronado, Poway, and most of northeastern of northern San Diego. Uh, he sits on the powerful Energy and Commerce Committee and has established a track record of championing pragmatic and ambitious climate policy, having led uh, and co-led some of the most consequential climate bills enacted since he joined Congress in 2012. And he's now pushing for climate to be included in the ambitious infrastructure and budget reconciliation bills. His Power On Act, which would clarify FERC's federal backstop siting authority over interstate transmission projects, is included in the bipartisan infrastructure deal, and many more of his climate priorities, including wildfire resilience and funding for the Department of Energy's loan program office are included in the reconciliation bill. He's one of the strongest advocates for carbon pricing in Congress and recently introduced the Fair Transition and Competition Act with Senator Coons, which would establish a carbon border adjustment for the United States, something I'm sure We'll hear more about uh, in the conversation today. Before we begin, I want to cover a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, we will be recording this re webinar, and a recording will be made available on our YouTube page, the C2ES YouTube page, within 24 hours. The format of today's webinar will be a fireside chat and uh, with some Q&A from you, the audience, um, followed by a panel discussion. Katrina Rourke, who is Vice President for Policy, at the Climate Leadership Council and is also on the steering committee of the Pricing Carbon Initiative. We'll conduct the conversation with Congressman Peters and then she'll turn it over to Alden Meyer, senior associate at E3G to lead our panel, uh, panel discussion and he'll moderate and introduce that as well. We'll have time for audience Q&A in each of these sessions. If you'd like to submit a question, please do so in the Q&A portion of Zoom using the Q&A function and we'll try to make sure that, they are, uh, that all those questions are answered. With that, uh, let me welcome you again uh, and turn things over to Katrina Work. Thanks, Nat. Uh, let me set a little bit more of the scene here because we have a ton to cover. So we're in the wake of the European Union releasing their Fit for 55 package, which included a carbon border adjustment mechanism that would price international emissions coming into the EU for the first time. We're in the middle of negotiating the reconciliation package, which could be the most influential climate policy Congress has ever enacted. Um, Congressman Peters, I'm sure, has been having many late nights about that. Uh, and we're staring down um, the next COP where countries are supposed to start enhancing ambition under the ratchet mechanism. So climate policy and diplomacy are very live issues right now. Um, I'm really excited that we have the opportunity to speak with you, Congressman Peters. Um, you, you are really thoughtful, really pragmatic, and really dedicated to creating policy change. So I know you're going to have a lot of insight to share with us today. Um, a request of the audience, I am terrible at talking, listening, and reading at the same time. So the earlier you get your questions, <laughs> the better for me. Um, let's dive in. Congressman Peters. There's a lot in the mix for this reconciliation package. We don't even know if this $3.5 trillion funding level is going to hold now. Um, how do you imagine the package taking shape um, and what's going to be in it? Well, Katrina, first of all, thanks for having me. And thanks to all the folks who are working so hard on uh, pricing carbon, which we all agree is um, really an essential tool if we're going to 
uh, make our numbers on time and even maybe make our numbers at all. So I, I just want to know, I really appreciate um, all the external help we have. Uh, so the reconciliation package is interesting because um, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is a trillion dollar bill, took five and a half months. And we're trying to do a three and a half trillion dollar bill in five weeks. Um, it would be my great preference to slow this down a little bit so that we can understand a little bit more um, what these programs are that we're starting to fund. And not so much around climate. I think I understand those things that are fairly straightforward, but you know, a lot of the family support uh, issues are really unclear to me. So, or you know, the social safety net stuff. Um, but it looks like we're trying to aim for a, some sort of vote in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and we're gonna mark to 3.5 trillion. The problem is that we already have senators, uh, at least one senator who said that his number is 1.5 trillion. And there might be other senators out there who um, even pick a lower number. Now that would still be historic, right? I mean, if you spent a trillion dollars on infrastructure and another trillion dollars filling in the gaps and, and bolstering the economy, um, that would be historic. It's just, um, there's just a lot of work between now and then. And my frustration is a little bit that if we take the vote to send a $3.5 trillion uh, bill to the Senate, we won't be involved as House members in deciding what the trade-offs are as we go from 3.5 to 1.5 or, or 1. And I think that that's, that's part of what our job is. So uh, I would tell, that's a long way of saying, I don't know what's going to be in it. Um, I, I do think that it's going to be much smaller but still it's gonna be really big and there's a lot of details to fill in. So um, I think it may, it, it may slow down of its own weight as people start to realize that people have different opinions. I think you may have seen that a little bit on some other issues this week I was involved in. Um, we had uh, 52 hours of markup in, in three days. So if I'm a little groggy, I apologize, but, um, uh, but um, I think carbon price, has, there's a huge opportunity for carbon price to play a role in this. I'm happy to talk about that more. Yeah, it would be great. I, I saw today some analysis from the Rhodium Group, and it broke down um, some of the sort of marquee climate policies under consideration in the infrastructure package and in the reconciliation bill. And their analysis says that it could get us about halfway to the administration's right. pledge to cut emissions in half. So um, what's missing? How's that for a softball? So think about climate policy in three ways. There's direct federal investment, maybe in things like basic research, in infrastructure resiliency. There's, um, there's uh, ways to regulate things. I think probably methane is something that probably has to be regulated. It's too cheap to take care of itself. Uh, and then there are ways to incentivize the private economy. What we've typically done is offer tax breaks for this technology or this technology. Uh, there's a lot of all that in there. Um, to me, I think the, the nice thing about a carbon tax, if you think, or a carbon, some sort of carbon price, is that you could you can incorporate it and just by putting it onto the economy, it, it achieves a lot of the goals without necessarily even having a budgetary impact. You could refund a lot of it. I think you'd have to. Um, I think that's a good idea in many ways, but you have to meet President Biden's promise not to raise taxes on anybody who makes less than $400,000. Um, but, you know, you could hold some of the revenues aside to help um, places that are adjusting to new kind of employment away from, you know, legacy uh, oil and gas jobs, for instance. And I think that there's some discussion about that going on in the Senate, but it's not very well developed. Um, my concern is kind of what you said, is that you pick these technologies one by one, and I think they're helpful. In many ways, the solar tax credits are really important to get the business going. But at some point, the really the better incentive is just to do something that's technology neutral and economy wide. The, the other big feature of the, of the um, uh, reconciliation bill as it's drafted is the, is the way we're dealing with the energy sector through price incentives, which is fine, but it's just the energy sector. And that may not survive the bird rule as well. So I think, the, the, I think that the whole discussion may come to us because a carbon tax is, is undeniably related to budget and taxes and would survive this process. It's a remarkable opportunity to do it. Folks on the left and in the middle are, are really open to it. And um, the president's staff, has, I guess, has started asking questions about it, whereas before they were saying, 
oh, it's politically impossible. So, uh, you know, I'm certainly going to be pushing for it. I think it would make a lot of sense and make all the other things we're doing a lot more effective. If you had to put a number on it, um, how likely do you think a carbon tax is to come into the mix in the reconciliation package? Um, well, I would, I could put, I would not put any, any good amount of money on any number that I picked. Okay. Um, but, you know, and I, it's really hard to tell because, um, you know, I think that, I think that in many ways, some of the senators are just getting their chance to be heard. So, um, I, I know that, um, Heinrich Whitehouse, Coons, um, Shots have all talked about this. They may have different visions, but I, I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's in the, uh, it's been planted in watered stage. It's just not grown into a flower yet. So I, I think there's a really good chance. I would say the other thing too, is if you were cutting back on expenditures, you know, a lot of those, I think a lot of those uh, well-intended uh, industry specific tax incentives are well, are, you know, are, are, are nice to have, but they're certainly a lot less efficient than a direct price on, on carbon would be. And so you might be able to do a trade that actually got you better policy with, with less money. I know that's not how we often think about things in that building, but that would also make sense. So I, I think it's a, it's a conversation that's sort of germinating now and um, I will try to support it and make sure that it bears fruit. So you remarked on um, this fast moving process, but the process that's underway right now is also um, strictly partisan. Yeah. And you've talked a lot in the past about the value of bipartisan policymaking, bipartisan policymaking around climate. Has this process shifted your thinking? Um, how are you thinking about the value of bipartisanship today? I think bipartisanship has intrinsic value for the country. I think uh, if you ask the average person what they want from their government, they won't tell you about a specific policy. They'll tell you they just want us all to work together to make things um, happen. And the the feeling of division in the country is, I think, probably the biggest challenge that we have. Because if you can't talk to one another as, as Americans, if you've identified each other as the opponent, um, that gets in the way of solving any problem. And um, so I think bipartisanship is something that's not just a means to an end, but it's an end itself. And, and I, I'm really happy in that respect about the infrastructure bill, which has a lot of good stuff in it and important things. Um, I see now that there's an opportunity to do more, and I, I'm not going to stick my nose up at that. Um, and to the extent that Democrats are moving money around to have an effect on climate change, um, you know, you're going to hear from me about um, about carbon tax. You, you know, probably some other things. Wildfires is another thing that's very important to to, um, to California. Um, I want to take advantage of that moment. It wouldn't be my choice in how to proceed. But let me just say one other thing, Katrina, is that we worked really hard to get Republicans who are sympathetic to come out from behind the curtain and say, I'm for a carbon tax. Democrats, you know, people ask me, what carbon tax do you support? I say the one that Republicans will vote for. And I know that there's, there's people who are sympathetic. I know that there's Republicans uh, in the Senate and in the House who think this is a good policy idea. And um, they believe in markets as a tool for allocating resources and creating jobs. Um, but we've had a, just a hell of a time getting people to come out and say, I'm gonna co-sign your bill. And it's still an obstacle. And we worked, um, we worked hard with the Evangelical um, Environmental Network. Uh, evangelical voters are the biggest, climate, biggest um, growing group of climate voters. Young Republicans are interested in climate change. Elected Republicans have noticed that. Um, and we really try to get, get support from, from that sector, but we just haven't been able to break through. So um, partly because I think it, bipartisanship is important, I would emphasize that. But I also recognize that we're in a moment where I haven't gotten Republicans uh, on board yet publicly and where Democrats are doing something that offers an opportunity. So I think we should take advantage of that. So eventually we'll come to the end of the reconciliation process. An you avenue. promise? You promise? <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I mean, it's your, more your job than mine, but uh, maybe you need to promise. So um, eventually, there will be opportunity to be more deliberate about the bipartisan policymaking opportunity here. At the same time, the Republicans now have um, a lot more concerted efforts 
approved by leadership to work on climate policy. How do you envision taking advantage of those opportunities and working with Republicans in the future? First of all, that's really good news. Like I said, I think in 2018, for the first time, there was evidence that, you know, uh, environmental issues have already always pulled well among everybody, it was, but it was never the reason that a voter would pull the lever for one person or the other. In 2018, it looked like that started to change. And as I said, among younger Republican voters. So you have people, I worked with um, Dave McKinley from West Virginia on carbon capture. We passed the Use It Act. Uh, that was great. You know, we worked with um, Republicans to deal with HFCs and coolants. Um, that was good. Bruce Westerman from Arkansas wants to plant a trillion trees. Five cent answer to a $10 problem. But, you know, let, let's get everyone in the pool and, and, um, and that's good. And, uh, you know, we've talked to other people, I, I can't, can't say their names, who are interested in a carbon tax. So I think it's moving our way. Um, and we could, you know, obviously we want to continue to do it. We've, we've never solved any big problem in the country with one political party, whether it was, you know, waging a, a world war or getting someone to the moon or, you know, uh, dealing with a pandemic, we have to all be together on this. So we need to make progress while we can, but ultimately our success depends on everyone coming and getting behind this. I think it's moving that way. You see, um, you know, the military's there, you see business, business there, increasingly investors are demanding this. I went to, um, to uh, Houston to talk to the oil and gas industry about the importance of, of uh, controlling methane emissions. They now see that as a business competitiveness issue because their customers overseas want clean natural gas, not methane um, emitting natural gas production. So um, I think it's, you know, we still have to keep working at it. Um, and, you know, I think, like I said, it's, it's, it's gonna be necessary for us all to be on this, this mission if we're gonna, if we're gonna succeed. I want to I want to pull this thread about the competitiveness issues in creating lower carbon versions of fossil fuels, um, and sort of documenting emissions more broadly. The council has done a lot of work articulating the carbon advantage, and there's a lot of appetite for a hearing this good news story about um, American action to decarbonize, be more efficient than our partners, and but b I think there's a lot of opportunity commercially. Um, competitively in leveraging that carbon advantage moving forward. Um, you point out one example where that where that exists in the private sector already today, and you're a huge proponent of border carbon adjustments, um, ideally as part of uh, a package that advances a carbon fee, um, but you did introduce a piece of legislation with Senator Coons that would apply a border adjustment even without the carbon fee. Can you talk a little bit about your motivation for that bill? Uh, well, I think, you know, what, one of the things that I, I think probably the Senator agrees with me on is what's going to drive, what's going to force us into a discussion about carbon pricing, and it's international trade. Um, if you see um, uh, Europe's up $70, England came out at $70 or $80, Canada wants to go to 100 and some, um, all of a sudden, they're not going to just let us sit by and trade with them with, without taking care, taking stock taking account of the relative advantage that we have by not uh, by not imposing these costs on our own businesses. Um, at the same time, there's there's other countries that are doing less than we are. And so we don't we don't want to penalize ourselves. So um, if, if we if we agree with the concept that you have to adjust uh, at the border for to make everything fair, now all of a sudden you're into a discussion about accounting. Well, what would be the easiest way to account for it would be an economy-wide price on carbon. And we don't have that. So we built in some administrative study about how you would price uh, what we have so that you know, the companies that are doing the right thing aren't disadvantaged and the companies that aren't doing the right thing are encouraged. Uh, and meanwhile, that America can stay competitive. competitive. So, you, you probably want to, you probably want some sort of adjustment in any event it would be a lot easier with a carbon tax. But I think we wanted to get the concept on the table to make sure people understood that this is going to be a conversation in international trade. And um, you know, we, we will continue to promote an economy wide um, carbon tax as a, as a way to help account for our side. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. So it I mean, was um, the answer from the tired congressman articulate, not does the policy. 
uh, you, so we're backing into a carbon price um, by focusing on this this border adjustment. Well, I mean, the border adjustment is is a necessary policy, but I, I hope that it will also encourage us to find a way to, to do an accounting system that's that makes sense for everything. Um, so the, the European Union released their um, Fit for 55 package, which included the CBAM, and, and some of the response that they've been getting, particularly from countries that aren't, let's say, climate ambitious, um, has been pretty cutting. So um, China is opposed to the policy. Um, a Russian oligarch pointed out that their border adjustment might be more penalizing than the existing sanction series that face <laughs> Russia. So, um, I mean, that's that's a pretty bold pushback. Um, how how do you think this conversation is going to evolve on the international stage between countries that are interested in these tools and countries that are fearing these tools? Well, you also didn't say WTO. There's a issue about WTO compliance that we have to deal with. And, you know, I probably, we probably have to deal with this head on as part of climate negotiations. And, you know, this is one of the things we have to discuss as a world community uh, about um, how, how to create climate alliances and kind of fair rules for, for everything. So, um, you know, I would expect that, uh, that the, the, this kind of idea wouldn't get love right out of the gate, but, um, you know, I do think it's gotta be part of our discussions internationally. How are we gonna get to a point where uh, this is part of the calculus of what's fair in terms of trade? Right. Um, and how do you think this is gonna inform the conversation at COP? So we're, we're walking in and already there's um, there are a lot of distractions, the pandemic, geopolitical tensions, um, a whole lot of supply chain constraints already right. because of the, the pandemic. So how will this um, uh, sort of new policy idea uh, impact our, our diplomacy conversations at the COP and, and more generally when it comes to climate change? Uh, well, you know, I, you, like you said, you, you already gave some reactions of some folks. I hope that people will see it as a constructive way for the United States to be engaging. Mm -hmm. I feel a little bit uh, chagrined that we are lagging other countries that have uh, decided that pricing is, is a good way. I come from California where we have a price on carbon. I mean, we combine a low carbon fuel standard with a cap and trade, it works great. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I think it's something that we offer as part of the discussion. I hope it's taken as constructive. Um, it, it will also, be set up in a way that will encourage us to do better. Uh, and I think, uh, so I think there's some humility in that, but, um, but you know, maybe, maybe there's some, some leverage on, on uh, the United States to get in line with the rest of the developing world, developed world. And why do you think now 2020 to 2021 is the time that the border adjustment is coming to the fore Right, so the EU has one, we're talking about one here, Canada's expressed interest, Japan, UK. What's different today um, that's prompting this kind of interest? I just think that the numbers are becoming real. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we're not talking, a lot of places aren't talking in theory about this anymore. They're starting to experience uh, the incentive in, at work. And, and um, if I were one of the manufacturing companies in Germany, I would wanna say, hey, listen, uh, you know, I, I want a, I want a fair a fair deal, and um, so I just think this had to this had to occur as these incentives get implemented around the world. This this kind of thing would would naturally come up, and um, other other countries are really committed to carbon pricing and imposing these costs on their economy. Um, I think it, you know it's it's not surprising at all that they would demand um, to have a conversation about how to make that fair. And I think we should we should be open to it. Thanks. So I've exhausted my questions, but the audience has been very busy sending them in. Um, so I'll turn to some some questions now from um, the folks that we have in the room. Um, one relevant question to the reconciliation plan. So um, we're talking about spending, um, let's say, um, two trillion dollars as the low ball. Um, and we have this report from Rhodium that says that that's not going to get us all the way there. So um, what is the appetite going to be for um, making substantive climate policy choices going forward if we're investing all of these resources and it's not enough? 
Well, that frustrates me. I think it's a point we need to make. I hope you will make it. Um, I will make it too, uh, because um, uh, I think I think it's undeniable that the, the the point is is not to make the investments; it's to make the numbers. And um, if we're spending money on things that won't work, uh, you know, let's let's switch to something that would work. So. Um, what's the appetite for that? I, I like I said, I, I'm optimistic that it grows as we talk about uh, as we talk about this. This is an opportunity. That, I mean, the Biden administration fancies itself to be the the climate leaders. I think they want it sincerely want to be um, the administration that takes that takes this on. I've tried to make the point from my seat at the committee and the budget committee too that you know why aren't you taking advantage of the single most effective tool that you have? That other Western countries have have uh, have taken advantage of, and they've um, they've come back only with it's not politically popular, it's not politically possible. Well, if that's your only hurdle, and you're doing a, a, a trillion, two trillion dollar extra spending program, I mean, I, I guess I don't understand that. Um, what we want to do is is we want to we want to make the uh, we want to make the numbers. We want to make the numbers on time, on car on carbon reduction and greenhouse gas reduction. Um, I'm optimistic that they'll listen to that. Plus, those those incentives are, you know, they're second best and they're more expensive. So, to the extent that you're trying to, you're worried about that, I think it it should open up that conversation. Yeah, I'm really interested on the tools we can use to talk more about motivating private capital rather right. than just public expenditures. Yeah. Well, I said I think that you know you. There are direct public expenditures that we should make. I think most of those have to do with research, um, and you know, with resiliency. Um, but the real action is in the innovation that happens in the private sector, and it's so easy to turn on that motivation uh, with even a small carbon fee. Because even a small carbon fee, the testimony we had at the committee recently was, if you had started, you know, ten years ago with a ten dollar a ton fee. It would have had a huge transformative impact just because it would have sent that signal. This is where we're going. Um, so you know you don't have to set the perfect price now. We, we can get started with this and ramp it up over time, uh, but we need to get started. And I, I think that's the pitch we all need to make. So I have another question um, about how the advocacy community can best support this. Um, what is the the most effective action that citizens and climate activists can take to get the carbon price in the reconciliation package? I think the message to send is thank you, Joe Biden, for making carbon, to making um, climate change a priority. Um, but if it's not going to work unless you do this thing. Uh, so so a, a sympathetic but slightly disappointed parent that says, um, you know, come on, you could do better. And, you know, I, and uh, I think the, the I think the facts matter in this case. Um, and I think the other thing is to engage some of the environmental groups. I mean, they all know better. All the economists agree with this. Janet Yellen said it. Everyone agrees that we have to have a carbon price uh, to achieve our goals. Now's the time to just get that word out with, with the force of your, of your academics and your, um, your facts. Uh, I think getting that word out, but also making sure that you're not sounding overly critical of the of the effort because the effort's a really righteous one. It's just right now, it's just a little bit falling short and a little bit misguided. More sort of detail-oriented question. You have been a strong supporter of walking and bicycling. What is in the infrastructure bill and reconciliation package for non-motorized transportation? I can't remember. There's a lot in there, huh? <laughs> I can't remember what's in what. I um, I I, I know more about uh, commuter rail, and I, I I think that there are bike lane grants and things like that, which I think would be great. Um, um, I've tried to get. I have a bill that I want. I want to pass called Build More Housing Near Transit, which is um, when I was just real quickly when I was uh, on the city council in San Diego. We were working to get an extension of the light rail called the Midcoast, and we, you know, we passed a ballot initiative, half cent sales tax. Then I come to the federal government, and we put the federal money in, and we're going to cut the ribbon. 
uh, in November. But nobody ever asked me when I was a local elected official, what are you going to build around my transit by big federal investment, right? Are you going to build housing near it? No, it's all parking lots. So fortunately, there's a pro-housing movement trying to retrofit those parking lots with housing to increase ridership and which would also um, mean more cars off the road. But my bill would make that part of the competition. Like part of the competition for federal money is what are you going to put next to the, to the transit investment we're making so that we'd actually get higher ridership and, um, and you know, more cars off the road. And um, I think that's sneaking around the uh, reconciliation package. More, more uh, questions to get the incentives right, huh? Um, okay. Uh, another detailed question. Are you suggesting that with a price on carbon, we would not need all of the uh, technology specific tax incentives that have been included so far? In many cases, yes. So I, I really think the way we should think of, if we had a technology neutral economy wide price on carbon, a lot of this stuff would take care of itself, except that some industries might need help to get going. So I'm thinking of tax incentives that last for a short time until the industry is a somewhat mature. Um, you know, that's, that's less of a need if it's a really hard, high carbon price, but I think, you know, to get technologies off the ground, I think it's reasonable to do that for a little while. But in general, I don't think you should need to subsidize particular um, green industries if, if the price signal itself would tell you which one was a better investment based on how much it costs. And that's what the beauty of this is, is it builds that, that incentive into decision-making so that um, consumers and businesses will choose the thing that makes the most sense from a climate perspective. So I think you can get rid of a lot of them. Maybe you'd keep a few just to get the industry started. Um, so if a carbon price makes it into the package and the Biden administration um, uh, considers a carbon price to uh, violate their their pledge to not raise taxes on people earning less than four hundred thousand um, dollars. What can you build into the policy to address that? I guess um, relatedly, I'll throw in a question: um, Should we perceive a carbon price to violate the the Biden administration's pledge not to raise taxes on uh, on folks earning less than four hundred thousand? Well, I don't think so. Um, I I don't think so. I would, um, but that's where we are. I mean, they're very. They're very hard on that, even though it's really even not, you could even argue it's not a tax on consumers. It would result in higher prices. So you just do a, you just do a rebate. You do a re rebate program that's focused on making sure that people get a check in their hand. This is your energy payment, uh, which they can use to offset their energy costs, or they could just hold it, put it in the bank and still do things, make choices to save energy down the road. I think that's how you do it. And you, you, you sort of do it as a consumer empowerment thing. Um, but you have to prove that we're not we're not increasing the energy burden on your household overall if you make that amount of money, um, and I think that's possible. We're we're tiptoeing into um, some of the four pillars of the Climate Leadership Council's package, right? A, a fee, a dividend, a border adjustment, um, but the one missing so far is regulatory simplification, right? Which would not be consistent with the Bird Rule. Um, but right. you've talked before about how um, it might be a reasonable hook to get industry on board um, with, with doing something ambitious through a carbon price. So if we can't get all four pieces into the reconciliation package, how do you bring industry along? I, I agree with you. I, I, uh, like I like, just like I think that <clears throat> the um, a carbon price would render some of these tax incentives are redundant. I think you could say, say the same thing about some regulations. And um, I think that's attractive. That's an attractive thing for the economy in general. It tends to be something Republicans notice more. Um, and again, um, they, they know that I'm open to, to it. It doesn't, it's not something that, that um, environmental groups give high fives over, but I also think if, if that's what it takes to get this policy, it's, it's more than worth giving up. Um, you know, so I don't know what, I don't know what the state of play is coming out of the reconciliation if we actually built that in, <clears throat> but, you know, then I think you're sort of into a, into a regulatory reform 
uh, discussion that may have to stand on its own. So it's stronger when it's all integrated, I think. It's a more, has more bipartisan appeal. But if we put it into the democratic package, I guess I don't see a lot of support for um, getting rid of those regulations right off the bat, but I would work with anyone to, to, to do that for things that are redundant. We overregulate a lot of stuff in the name of the environment that actually gets in the way of helping the environment. And um, I acknowledge that from time to time. Um, a question related to the BCA, but for the methane fee. So yeah. um, can you create a border adjustment um, with the methane fee as, as currently conceived in the package? I think you could count that in as, as part of the accounting. I think the issue with the methane fee right now is, um, you know, we have to nail down how, how you're measuring emissions. Um, but um, I think, I think, yeah, I mean, it's a cost, it's a cost we're imposing on carbon. I think it could be part of the, part of the calculus in theory. Um, okay, this one is a little bit, a little bit long. I'll try and get it all in. So um, a stated concern. The border adjustment is an intuitive concept, but implementation is very difficult. The EU is calling out five sectors, steel, aluminum, fertilizers, electricity, cement. How will we manage our BCA in terms of addressing the EU BCA? Um, well, th oh, sorry, go ahead. No, um, this leaves room for gaming the system. That concludes. Right, I, you know, this is, this is part of what we talk about, right? I mean, we talk about, um, you know, we do uh, emissions trading. There's like a whole discussion in, in, uh, in the cops about how to get the accounting right. I think we're gonna have the same kind of uh, conversation about um, the border adjustment. Obviously it's a lot easier if we have a economy-wide price on carbon, it's a lot easier to do the accounting. Um, but part of our bill is that we, you know, we send people back to figure out how to do the accounting. And I think it's gonna be hard. I don't, I don't think there's any, the without a, without economy wide price on carbon, it, it's harder to do the accounting than it would be with it. But that's what we do. You know, that's, you know, that's kind of what you negotiate. Right. I, I sort of want to challenge the premise of the question a bit, um, because it doesn't have to be all that difficult to implement a border adjustment, right? When goods come in, we know exactly what they are. They're already classified in, in the harmonized tariff system. Um, they already have the product specific adjustments put on through the tariff system. We've got a trade administration that presently exists. So the, the tricky part here is how much is the adjustment? Right. Um, and then uh, how do you figure out the basis of emissions? And, and those are both things that we can sort through in the policy process. Yeah, that's the, that's the only thing I was calling difficult. I, I get all the, you know, they're still coming in on containers and you can, you can count the units. It's just like, how do you assign a carbon value or carbon cost to each good? And I think that's, um, you know, I mean, that's gonna be, um, that's gonna start out pretty theoretical before it gets, it gets defined. I wanna take a moment to talk about the, the border adjustment in international diplomacy, but through the lens of, of least developed countries. So um, I think the data is still true that there is um, the least developed countries make up less than 5% of trade in the most carbon intensive goods, um, but they're still important trading partners. They might not have the same kinds of um, reporting system architecture in place, might be more right. challenging for them right. to comply with border adjustments. How should we think about least developed countries um, in this new future where we're better aligning trade and climate? I do think that with respect to the carbon price, you know, they need to have some, uh, they need to have some break, they need to have a longer runway. Um, but I would also say that that's not, that should not be the only part of our foreign policy with respect to developing countries. I, what I've not seen from the administration that I'm, um, I think there's a big opportunity is to have a, a energy export foreign policy for those, for those countries, whether it's American nuclear or, um, you know, you could argue about liquefied natural gas. Um, I mean, I don't think it's as good as nuclear, but whatever it is, whether you want to do distributed energy the United States government should be actively engaged in making sure that they don't take that coal out of the ground, which is cheap in a lot of places still through foreign policy. So I wouldn't rely, I wouldn't rely uh, on just pricing 
And I don't think it would be effective uh, to rely just on pricing for those developing countries. We need a aggressive foreign policy that's also about um, you know, energy supply and energy development. Not to mention, by the way, saving trees. We have to save some forests as well. But um, again, that's something that probably is not taken care of by pricing, but has to be taken care of maybe by a different pricing mechanism. How do you value those, those forests and, and you know, make sure it's worth it for them to retain them? Those are two elements of foreign policy that I would like to see. I just haven't seen yet. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of movement towards figuring out how to value natural climate solutions, um, particularly if that can help support uh, developing economies. Um, so another, another question that's come up a couple of times from the audience is um, what you're hearing from the private sector about the infrastructure package and the reconciliation bill and what those are most appropriate policies would be going forward. You know, we hear, um, you know, the Business Roundtable and the American Petroleum Institute say they're for market-based solutions. Um, but you know, so I see if there's, if something happens, I think this is what they would want. Um, and so, you know, we, we certainly know that they're open to it. Um, the utility industry, power sector seems to like the clean energy standard kind of approach, um, but that only deals with their sector. So, um, I, you know, I would say that we don't hear a lot of advocacy around it. We've sort of, sort of heard um, what we're open to. So in other words, I think the American Petroleum Institute would rather have a carbon price than anything else, but they're not banging on our door saying, give us a carbon price. Um, and um, I think it's going to be up to us to put something on the wall. So we've, we're coming down to the end of this conversation. I want to flag that with, uh, with most of the questions comes um, a thank you for your work on carbon pricing. Um, so I don't want to leave out the important part of this, which is... Um, Take as much time as you need. Yeah. Okay. I'll just read <laughs> all of them. Bravo for... Um, but I guess let's get in um, a little bit more conversation about the, um, the reconciliation package. And um, I guess uh, if, if you could sort of hold the keys here and design it going forward, um, what would your top three priorities be um, for this, this reconciliation package um, moving out? I would think a carbon price would be one of them. Uh, and to really um, comb through all the incentives to make sure that they're sort of integrated and they make sense and really drive us toward success. Uh, my other concerns would be around healthcare. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of people who aren't covered by insurance. I think we should work on that problem probably before we expand other, um, other programs uh, that aren't necessarily that solvent. And, um, I'd say drug pricing, but really, because that's what I've gotten a lot of flack for this week, but I think some fiscal stability would be a good thing. A good reminder that it's not just climate uh, on yeah. the line in this reconciliation package. Um, thank you for joining us at the end of a very busy, very dense policy week. Um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure, Congressman. Thank you so much, Katrina. Thanks again to you and the council for all the work you do. It's really so vital and it wouldn't happen. Nothing will happen without you. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on it and I uh, hope you have a wonderful and restful weekend. Thanks, likewise. All right, Alden, over to you. Thanks a lot, Katrina. That was a great conversation. The one thing I might dispute, I doubt if it's the end of his week. I think he's probably working through the weekend, but uh, that was a great discussion. You got a lot in there. Um, so we're going to take it forward to have a little interactive conversation here with uh, three very astute observers of the policy and political scene on all things climate and energy. We have Marty Durbin, who is the Senior Vice President of Policy for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Christina DeConcini, who is the Director of Government Affairs for World Resources and no stranger uh, to this group. She actually chairs the Pricing Carbon Initiative Board of Directors. And last but not least, we have Jim Boyce, who is a senior fellow and professor emeritus in the Political Economy Research Institute, or Perry, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So 
Welcome to all three of you. Uh, we heard a lot from Congressman Peters there. As I said, uh, Katrina really packed a lot into that 45 minutes. We heard uh, the outlook for reconciliation. He's not a betting person, but he seems uh, fairly optimistic that we'll get something over the finish line, if not uh, everything that he's advocating for. Uh, we heard obviously about the importance of carbon pricing, border carbon adjustment, and any kind of effective regime. Uh, we heard an openness to regulatory simplification, to maybe dropping some of the, uh, the clean energy tax incentives and some other things, which probably wouldn't go over too well with some in the Progressive Caucus on the Hill. Um, you know, we heard from him uh, referring to API and some other trade associations that he thinks what he's marketing is, is probably their uh, most preferred option, but he doesn't see them up there actively advocating for it. So a lot to discuss here. We want to first give each of the panelists uh, three or four minutes just to give their top line reactions, reflections on what they heard, uh, what your own prognostications and tea leave reading indicates uh, for these issues, and then we'll come back with some uh, more focused questions. So Marty, let me turn it over to you first. Uh, what did you hear from Congressman Peters? Uh, anything you didn't expect? How does it uh, sort of affect your thinking about the way forward? Well, and first of all, let me thank you and, 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 the, and the organization for, for inviting me to be here today. And, and I agree with you. I thought Katrina did a great job of having a, a, a really robust conversation with, with the congressman. I'm going to give the congressman a lot of credit, too. I mean, he's really leaned into uh, issues on climate, on, on pricing of carbon, and, and on the border carbon adjustment. So uh, I, I was very pleased to hear um, you know, what he laid out as far as you know, what's, what's going to be needed for us to go forward. Now, I should just in, in full disclosure here, and it's probably not a surprise to anybody, but with, a, with regard to the reconciliation package itself, the U.S. Chamber is very clearly opposed to the, to the package, not because of the climate provisions, but because of, of, of the, the size and everything else in, in, in the bill. But I don't want that to, you know, to distract from the important, you know, the in, in, important points that we need to be focused on around, around uh, you know, progressing on climate. I mean, I I think it's a disservice for us to think about the reconciliation bill as all or nothing or the only option we have. My reason for saying that is I think that we've, we've got some models before us here where we have made some significant progress on, on climate related uh, policy. It isn't enough yet and we need to do more, but we can't look back and see um, or we can't uh, uh, ignore the progress we made last year on the Energy Act. Many of you who I'm sure are, are part of the uh, 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 audience here were part of that effort. We we leaned in quite hard. I think that you know, Congressman Peters, uh, uh, Senator Whitehouse, and many others spent a lot of time, and we had very you know bipartisan uh, ac uh, action to be able to get the Energy Act focus on all of those technologies, technologies that we know we are going to need to be able to meet the global challenge and reduce emissions around the world. Again, that's not enough. But we also we, we, we had a model for how to do it in a bipartisan way with all stakeholders involved. We passed the AIM Act in a much more regulatory way on, on HFCs. We've seen the, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure package itself that has significant um, you know, climate related funding in there. Again, I'm not saying that's the end, but we've got models for what can be done. And we, we firmly believe that in order to make progress and, get, and, get, and to, to get the kinds of buy-in necessary to get durable policy passed by Congress, it's not possible to do that through a massive one-party written reconciliation bill. Uh, so I, I, at, at this point, I still I want to look at this as it, it being optimistic because I agree with Congressman Peters that more, uh, more voices are starting to look at what's necessary. You know, I mentioned the, the, the other things that are in the works this year, the Growing Climate, Climate Solutions Act that passed the Senate in, in, in a bipartisan way. We're working to get that through the House as well. From the chamber standpoint itself, as yes, we saw where the debate was going, as you know, as we, we were one of the groups, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll take uh, I'll lump myself in with API and the, and the business roundtable, the chamber also came out in support of market-based mechanisms. And, and frankly, he's right. We aren't up asking for one specific uh, you know, uh, proposal. Part of that had to do is as, as the debate shifted, you know, through the year, and we saw the clean energy standard take much more of the of the uh, of the oxygen, if you will. We pull our members together to get, you know, their their thoughts around what what a clean energy standard should look like. Done the same thing with carbon border adjustments as well. 
to me, the message is that our, from, from our membership, they're incredibly engaged on all of these issues. So we, we had a very robust process with members across the different sectors to get us to the support for market-based mechanisms, to give us really concrete ideas on, on the principles for a clean energy standard, and again, on the, on the border carbon adjustment. Uh, and by the way, I want to, again, congratulate and applaud Congressman Peters and Senator Coons for the work they did on, on their bill. Not only the fact that they put it out there, but they and their team reached out to, to us and many others, and we were able to you know, get briefings from them, provide specific feedback, and are continuing those conversations. So I'll kind of just kind of wrap up with, I think, that what I heard from uh, Congressman Peters as well, that you know, markets are, are, are really important factors here for us to, to, to focus on. They aren't sufficient, but we know that the use of markets and, and, and having a price on carbon is, is probably the most efficient way for us to get what we're all looking for, which is to drive emissions down as far as we can, as fast as we can, and at the pace of innovation. We know markets are efficient at, at mobilizing capital that will then turn into you know, spurring competition among members that will drive even further innovation and could very well, and I suspect that we may be able to accelerate timelines on, on being able to meet some of the goals that we've all set out there. So lots to talk about here, but I, I will stop there, Alan, and, and, and look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Marty. Just before I go to Christina, maybe one follow-up based on something uh, Congressman Peter said. Uh, Katrina asked him what, what carbon pricing bill would he support, and he answered uh, the one that would pick up enough Republican votes to pass. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying the Commerce, uh, Chamber of Commerce opposes the current reconciliation package, too partisan, too big. Uh, do you see any indication from your conversations with Republicans on the Hill that they could get behind a meaningful carbon pricing regime that would meet your uh, requirements and be bold enough to get the job done? Well, two-part answer. Not within the reconciliation package, of course, but I do think that, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that in a in a matter of a few weeks you could get the, get enough people together. But I do think there is a growing appetite and at least an ability to have the conversation uh, among Republicans that uh, that we've been working with. Uh, but again, I, I, th I think the broader the broader picture here is let's show that we can continue to use the model we used in the Energy Act and with the infra uh, bipartisan infrastructure package that starts to uh, you know, breed some cooperation as opposed to potential division. Thanks. Uh, we'll come back to this, I'm sure, in the discussion. But uh, Christina, over to you. What, what did you hear from uh, Congressman Peters that really struck you? And, and what's your take on where carbon pricing fits into the outlook on reconciliation and maybe some other uh, ways forward on the Hill? Um, so thank you. Um, everyone for inviting me and for the um, interesting conversation with um, Congressman Peters and Mr. Durbin from the chamber. Uh, I, I guess um, the way I was going to start on this is about the reconciliation bill, and then I'm going to move to the part about why it needs to include a price on carbon. So, um, you know, despite what um, some of our colleagues, even on this panel, have said, the reconciliation bill contains extremely strong climate policy on everything from clean energy tax credits, um, cleaning up the um, electricity sector, uh, putting a fee on methane, et cetera, and uh, investing in EV infrastructure, which as we know, um, transportation is the biggest source of greenhouse gas pollution, and we need to get at that, and we're gonna need the infrastructure to do it. It also, a recent study shows that it would create 8 million jobs. So um, I just want to be clear that statements that are all over the press from including the chamber that this isn't a climate bill and it doesn't have climate provisions, that's just not actually true. Um, I understand there's other reasons that they want to oppose it, but that, that's not a true statement. That it's not a serious attempt to create durable climate policy was the statement. So, um, and then um, the, the next issue is um, bipartisanship and working with corporations. So my organization, the World Resources Institute is one of several that engages very seriously with corporate actors in trying to get good climate policy across the finish line. We take a lot of slack for that and we're very, um, determined to, to do that, and we see that as a way forward. I will acknowledge that we have had some small gains, which are good. 
the HFC, some stuff on um, carbon dioxide removal, um, you know, uh, the Energy Act that Mari mentioned. So we have been very supportive of all of those things with the bipartisan support. We've also been very active in CLC and some other dialogues where we all know that the ideal bill would be bipartisan. I don't know anyone who doesn't agree with that. So I, I interviewed Senator Schatz a while ago on this. He said, um, I'd rather have 60, no, 70 votes. Of course, that's what people want. And, but we have been, we haven't really tried at climate. We haven't had a, we haven't had a window to try at comprehensive climate policy for more than 10 years. During that 10 years, despite a lot of efforts by people like my organization, um, you know, trade associations, um, other groups, we don't have any Republican who has come forward to support any kind of comprehensive policy. We also, um, it's great, some of the trade associations have changed their wording on this, but they have not put forward, this is the carbon pricing policy that we would support and working to lobby for that. So this comes to the issue of, um, oh, this is this the only option we have? And I guess the big, the big um, gap is really on whether you think the climate crisis has to be addressed really soon, or we can just keep taking baby steps with some little good bipartisan wins here and there, but we don't really have to like head on address this. And I think that must be where we um, kind of part ways with a lot of folks, because we think it's really critical and we support all of those smaller steps, but we believe there's an opening here and we're not gonna have an opening like this for a very long time to act on climate. So, um, uh, as um, it, Marty was very forthright as he is always that, um, you know, the chamber, NAM, API are engaged in six figure ad campaigns and Facebook and all over the place with moderate de Democrats to try to do everything they can to stop um, this um, from going forward. And I do understand that it's not um, solely based or even primarily based on the climate provisions, but we do also have the statements that say that this isn't going to really move climate where we know it will. So um, I wanted to flag that I think people saw there were 12 NGOs. And again, we're, that NGOs on this letter are ones like us at C2ES and the NGOs that really do engage with corporations on a very regular basis and have for years, um, came out with a statement a couple days ago um, saying that given the urgency of this and that we're sort of in the um, I don't know end zone or whatever we're in the we're in the um, you know 59 min minute of the last hour whatever that um, analogy would be we don't have an option here if we're going to be aligned with saying we care about climate so the letter basically said that if you are opposing reconciliation in its entirely it's not considered consistent with supporting climate action. For my organization, this is a really big step to say that, and it's and we wouldn't have said it in, I mean, uh, May, we wouldn't have said it in June or July, but we're still working and working. We've done all we can. We've done all the lobbying we can. We pulled out all the stops. There's no bipartisan support. So, um, you know, bipartisanship is highly preferable, but it can't be a goal in and of itself at the cost of addressing climate. Okay, now my last point is that I wanna talk about um, the reconciliation and the bipartisan infrastructure deal. Um, um, and I, we've sent around a blog that um, my CEO and Dan Lashoff put out uh, yesterday. Uh, while I just said all these very good things about it, we are totally supportive of it. Um, we know from, so, Please, nobody misinterpret that we don't support any part of it. We support it. But as Congressman um, uh, Peters said, we've got to follow the facts here. And um, Schumer's has done a wonderful job on this. And his own pie chart shows that maybe we can get to 45% with the rest of these policies. So there's a couple of things. 45% isn't 50%. And more importantly, we all know that there's a lot of uncertainties on 
on technology, on um, politics, et cetera. Um, WRI does have analysis that with local action, you might be able to make up the difference. But the bottom line is we can't bet the climate on getting almost there or close enough there. And that's why we put out, and it was wonderful that we were able to um, cite the RFF study that I think Katrina noted and others have noted that came out yesterday as well, that showed that if you have all of those policies and a $15 price on carbon, you absolutely can get to the 50% and maybe 52%. And the other thing I just wanna say about the price and then stop, because I think I went over is, um, while all of the pieces in the reconciliation and bid are excellent and we support, there really isn't policy in there that gets at the industrial sector. So, um, and that is something that is 23% of US emissions. And that does matter. And a price on carbon would be one of the things um, that uh, would do that. So I wanna be on the record as saying, do I think this is the ideal way to uh, legislate? Nope, I don't. Um, but have we joined every coalition and worked as hard as we could on the bipartisan thing and done as many Hill visits for more than 10 years and worked in every way, shape and form to um, move things forward? Yes, we have. And so we're now sort of at a finish line of whether we're going to act in a way that if the reconciliation package and the BID were to pass, it would be the largest in the history of the United States climate legislation to ever um, become law. It wouldn't be enough, but it would be a big start. And um, if you add the carbon tax in, it really would, uh, as we've heard from all these people, uh, you know, jack that up across the board. So that's all I have to say now, thanks. Thanks a lot, Christina, a lot to unpack there. Um, Jim, you have the advantage of the four of us of being the one that's not based in Washington, DC, and you've been observing this uh, this issue for a, a long time now from your perch up in Amherst. What's your view on the current sausage making exercise that Congress is going through and the outlook for carbon pricing and any kind of meaningful policy to come out of this? Well, you're right, Alden. There are times when I um, thank my lucky stars that I'm not in DC, even though it means I don't have that close up view. I think it also maybe helps uh, one sense of perspective um, not to be immersed in, in the fishbowl world there. Um, I think uh, Congressman Peters' uh, comments, uh, what really struck me and, and I wanna sort of uh, riff on a little bit is the role of fairness in thinking about uh, climate policy. He presented border carbon adjustments as a, a way to achieve greater fairness. And I think that's absolutely right. Uh, it's a question of fairness to US producers, including not only industry, but also workers, the people who work in our industries. And um, he mentioned some other aspects of fairness as well. And, and I wanna expand a little bit on those. Uh, one was he mentioned uh, the importance of um, what sometimes is called a just transition for workers in the fossil fuel sector, for, for people who've brought us our energy in the past. And I think that's a, a very important piece of the overall policy mix that deserves attention. And uh, similarly, I think we should uh, pay comparable attention to the communities that have borne disproportionate impacts from the use of fossil fuels, from fossil fuel combustion. And we know that uh, to a very large extent, these are communities of color and low income communities around the country, which have borne uh, exceptionally high costs of air pollution from uh, the combustion of fossil fuels. And so one piece of the puzzle that I also think we need to put into the mix is a policy that address what I see as the very well-grounded fears of the environmental justice community, that were we to have a carbon price, of course, one of the merits of a carbon price is precisely that it allows flexibility in terms of how much reduction in emission takes place in which locations. Were we to have such a uniform price and nothing else, there would be a risk that in some locations emissions would not go down as much and indeed might even go up. For example, if we convert from burning coal to burning natural gas uh, as a transition fuel in the electricity sector, the places near natural gas power plants are likely to see more emissions. And again, these are primarily communities of color and low-income communities. So an important 
thing we should add into the mix, I believe, is a mandate that whatever our carbon reduction goals are, there should be comparable goals for reducing co-pollutant emissions in what are called EJ or environmental justice communities as identified by tools like the EPA's EJ screen. This is completely doable. It's fair. It's also efficient because these are places where we're going to see particularly large positive impacts on public health from emissions reductions. A recent report that I co-authored came out in March called Green for All. People can find it on the web if they want. Looks at the case for doing this and also at the cost of not doing it, of failing to do it. So I think that's an important part of fairness as well. Another important part has to do with the impact of carbon prices on people's standards of living, particularly if the prices are robust enough really to have an impact at the gasoline pump, an impact on electricity prices, and so on. I think, um, as several speakers have emphasized, what's most important is to reduce our emissions. And to my mind, a very um, simple piece of policy that could be inserted into the mix is to have a guarantee that we do so, that we do so on a trajectory consistent with the Paris objective, a trajectory that would mean cutting emissions by roughly seven or eight percent per year for the next 30 years. That's what would be required to bring about a 90 percent reduction in emissions from fossil fuels. Um, and to do that, we could have a cap on the total amount of fossil carbon that we allow to enter into our economy, a cap that diminishes by seven or 8% per year for 30 years. You could call that the carbon guarantee, right? That would be a form of certainty that would be very useful for industry among others in planning what to do in the future. Now, if all other policies that we implement, incentives of various types, a carbon tax, regulations, public investments, if all those policies are so successful that they get us where we need to go, then that cap no longer is binding. It doesn't come into effect because we're cutting our emissions by at least that much. But if it's not, if it's not effective, then what having uh, such a cap would do is it would constrain the supply of fossil fuels and thereby raise their price. And I think it's likely that that would happen. I don't think that's just possible. I think it's likely. So if that happens, we need to think, as the congressman pointed out, about the impact on people's standard of living. And it seems to me that, as he suggested, rebating part or all of the money back to the people as what he called energy payments. That's what the Green Party in Germany is calling this idea now as well. Uh, it's what others, including myself, have called carbon dividends. Rebating that money back to the people on an equal per person basis is a way to protect the purchasing power of low income and middle income families, working families in the face of higher fuel prices. Um, the analogy I've used in my book, The Case for Carbon Dividends, is to a parking lot. Imagine if you've got a, a thousand people working in an office building and limited parking space that, that only lets in about five, about 300 people. All right. If that's your situation and you don't price the parking lot, you're going to have chronic congestion or excess demand for parking. So what you do is you impose a parking fee. And at the end of the month, you take the money and you distribute it equally to everyone who works in the building. The people who don't use a car to get to work, who ride a bike or walk, get their share of the money, even though they pay nothing in a parking fee. The people who carpool to work break out, come out about even, they break even. And the people who drive every day in a single occupancy vehicle pay more than they get back. Well, a carbon price applies that, and a dividend applies that same idea to parking carbon in the atmosphere. Those who consume less carbon come out ahead. Those who consume more pay more than they get back. And because carbon consumption is so closely correlated with income and wealth, what we know and what many studies have shown, and I talk about a few of these in, in my book, is that the vast majority of working Americans come out ahead from a carbon fee and dividend or cap and dividend policy in sheer purchasing power terms, not even counting the climate benefits and economic benefits of that policy. So I think that's an important component of fairness as well. So to wrap up, let me just say, I think 
Border carbon adjustments, yes, they're a key part of the policy mix. Fairness more generally, including justice for communities that have been uh, really uh, on the front lines in terms of energy production and the impacts of uh, energy related pollution. Absolutely, that should be part of the mix. A strong policy that guarantees that we meet our emissions reductions trajectory. Absolutely, that's what ought to be part of the mix too. And for that, we don't just need a, a tax, we need a cap, a limit on the amount of carbon we're going to allow into the economy. And we need to face the consequences of imposing such a limit in terms of the likelihood of higher prices and the impacts that those will have on people's purchasing power. And so finally, to cope with that, we need to have carbon dividends that rebate the money back to the people, the money from energy pricing um, for reasons of political feasibility, for reasons of ethics, basic principle being that the limited carbon absorptive space belongs to all of us in equal and common measure and for economic reasons in order to try to make a dent in the yawning economic and political inequality that is also one of the great crises we now face in this country. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jim. And uh, let's, uh, let's now open it up with all three of the panelists. And Marty, I'll come to you first. You, you heard uh, Christina describe the letter from uh, her CEO and a number of other CEOs, including that of my former organization, Union of Concerned Scientists, which uh, was pretty extraordinary in my view, not only disagreeing with the position, but calling on your member companies uh, to distance themselves from your position uh, because this is our one shot on reconciliation. It won't surprise you, there's a number of questions in the Q&A uh, directed uh, at, at you based on, on what you said. I'll just read one of them and then give you a chance to, to respond. Uh, for two decades, the Chamber has opposed serious climate measures again and again, from McCain-Lieberman to Lieberman-Warner to Waxman-Markey, as well as U.S. participation in major climate agreements, including claiming the Paris Agreement would cost America millions of jobs. Doesn't the Chamber's strong opposition to reconciliation suggest the Chamber sits on the side same side of this that it always has when it matters, when there are real votes on real legislation with serious measures on climate that are at the scale of solutions needed. And, and this might be put in the context of, of I think, the, the question to Exxon when their, their, uh, their lobbyist was, was caught on tape uh, rather cynically uh, saying they supported a carbon price because they knew it had no chance of passing. So I, I wonder what your response is to this and what you can say to convince people that you really are on the side of the angels here in terms of climate action and that you will actively work for some alternative uh, to what you're opposing on the Hill now? Well, the, the answer is no to the question. And, uh, and, and so let me go back when, when Christina mentioned, you know, it's true, we have a statement out there that says well, this is not a climate bill. The point of that was not that there aren't climate provisions in the bill. The point was to say that you can't say this is only a climate bill and just go ahead and ignore everything else that's in it. Instead, what we're saying is, you know, the, the, the climate is important enough that it needs to be done and, and we need to get policy in place that's going to be durable. And we already know that this is a bill that, you know, is, is having, having trouble getting 50 votes on, on, across the board anyhow. And besides, and again, we're clearly opposed to much of what's in the bill. But why wouldn't we then continue to follow the model that's been that's been bearing fruit here you know, to, in working with, as Christina said, with WRI and many other groups that, that have been putting a lot of, you know, a lot of shoulder into this. But we were pleased to be working closely with them on the Energy Act, on the AIM Act, on other things that are that are showing fruit here. So I just I just re reject the idea that this I think I guess it's a false choice as to whether it's reconciliation or nothing. We, we must make progress on climate and we can and we will. And from the chamber standpoint, that is what we've been working on. I've been there two years now, teams, you know, my team's been there you know, longer than that. We've been very focused on, on, on you know, bringing the membership together where we can find consensus. That whole technology and, and market-based approach is where we, where we have found consensus. And now we're building out from that and continuing to, you know, to work, as I said, is you know, getting very clear principles on, on, on how we think we should be approaching things like clean electricity standard, clean energy standard, the border carbon adjustment. So we aren't we aren't sitting on the sidelines. Uh, we are we we are you know continuing to engage and and we'll gladly and, and and willingly continue to partner with everyone here. You know to see progress that's going to get us to durable policy that's broadly supported 
in Congress. Thanks, thanks, Marty. Christina, let me let me turn to you on this. I mean, I think as you said, in an ideal world, we would we would support something that was bipartisan uh, at the scale that we need to get the job done. Obviously, policy is more durable in this country if it is at least somewhat bipartisan and, and less subject to being overturned uh, by changes in administration or control of the Congress. But do you see any prospect of the kind of vision that Marty lays out that we could get the scale and time frame of ur urgent action that we need given the current makeup on the Hill and the, the large scale Republican opposition to significant climate action? Is there any chance of what he says coming, uh, coming true? I mean, that's the unfortunate thing that we've really put our, um, our shoulder to the wheel on. The answer is no, certainly not in the time of frame that we have. And I'd be interested, Marty, if you have some analysis of how these various things are going to get us to the 50% point or uh, by 2030 or 2050, how we're going to achieve those goals. Because um, I think it, um, and, and just for the record, I don't want to keep um, uh, bashing this, but um, the chamber does actually say this isn't a climate bill, but I get that's not why you're opposing it. I'm totally down with that. We, we did say that. Yeah, and, and, we, what, and, what we, and we think it's we think it would be with the um, we, we don't just think it plus the bid would be the most significant climate um, bill ever passed by Congress. But let's move on from that. So I think, unfortunately, it does sort of seem like it comes down to um, a difference of view on the priorities and urgency of the climate action, because we do want to continue to work. And this won't solve everything on bipartisan piecemeal um, pieces, and WRI has probably one of the strongest track records on really engaging in that and complimenting the chamber when they engage in it. But um, we, we, we are following the facts, and that is not going to get us to where we need to go to meet administrations NDC or anything close to it in terms of the urgency of what we need to do now. So. Um, so unfortunately, I don't see that in the near future. I'm not saying, oh, maybe in 20 years, I can't predict 10 more years down the road, but um, we don't have that time anymore on our side. And we have done, I think, I feel like we really have a terrific record on doing everything we could possibly do to try to make that happen. Jim, do you want to weigh in on this at all from your perspective and in, in terms of the outlook for enough shift in the current Republican positioning to get something meaningful done in the time needed? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I'm not the inside uh, the beltway person on this panel, so I'm, I, I'm not the possibly the best one to answer that question. But I would say um, one has to keep in mind that there's a difference between the short run uh, picture and what could happen in the medium or longer run. And I think in the medium or longer run, it's um, quite possible. And of course, as everyone has said, highly desirable to have a robust carbon price emerge as a policy with bipartisan support. And it's important, even though we are focusing in, in this conversation on the short run prospects of the reconciliation bill and its pros and cons, it's important at the same time to be thinking about that medium and long run and about how we can fashion a carbon price that will actually do the job, both um, in terms of protecting the climate, in terms of protecting people's uh, livelihoods and incomes, and in terms of being politically viable. So I think, um, in the short run, yes, like, like uh, others, I'm pessimistic. Uh, in the medium and longer run, um, well, I, I'm hopeful. Uh, I try to let hope uh, have a little bit of inroads on my pessimism uh, by looking further down the road. Katrina, did you want to, uh, Katrina, Christina, did you want to come in again? Um, I did, thank you. I just wanted to say, I don't want to bore this group with um, all the things that we have done to try to make that happen. Um, you know, in 2017, when um, uh, President Trump took office, this incredible coalition of the biggest companies in the um, United States and world, the um, Climate Leadership Council came together. Baker and Schultz had one of the first meetings in the White House supporting a $40 price on carbon. My CEO said, 
well, we got to get at that table. And we've been very proud to be at that table. The amount of effort that has been, it's not as though people haven't tried every angle because um, Congressman Peters is not alone. There are multiple senators who have said, I'll support any pricing bill that Republicans will support. So, um, you know, great places like Climate Leadership Council have come up with something they thought they would support. You know, it just hasn't materialized, but I can't overemphasize the effort that has been made to this point. I'm not trying to say that in 10 years, something won't be changed, but I don't think we have the time for that. And it's unfortunate. If, if I could, Alan, I also think, you know, recall Congressman Peters also said his preference would be that we could slow down this reconciliation process to be able to, you know, dig more into a lot of what's in there. Again, that's more broadly. I know he wasn't just talking about, uh, about climate provisions, but, you know, let's also look at, you know, the, you get to you know estimates on 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 how how quickly we can get somewhere. If we go back twelve years, no one had an analysis that estimated that the United States would reduce its carbon emissions as, in the power sector as much as it as much as it did, as much as it has, and more than any other country, because of market you know market driven uh, advances, technology advances in, in production of natural gas. Okay, that, that that so my only point in saying that is that that wasn't predicted or estimated. What we do know is that we're going to need to you know, we're going to need technologies in order to, to to meet the goals that we've set out. Whether you want to call it net you know, mm -hmm. zero by twenty fifty or whatever target you want to set, we're going to need technologies. We're going to need policies. We're going to need market signals that allow that all to happen. And so there, there's a lot to be able to work with here and, and keep us focused on that. Again, I'm going to say again, markets aren't enough. We also need regulation. Mm -hmm. you know, HFCs is a perfect example. Methane is mm -hmm. another perfect example. And there are incentives that, that work into the process here as well. But I, I, I simply, we, we simply just don't agree that this is, this is the only option we have on, on, on this bill and that we can't lose the opportunity to continue to build consensus everywhere we have the chance to do that and move the ball down the, down, down the field. Thanks, Marty. And, and I think we've gotten uh, positions clearly out here, and I, I don't think we're going to resolve this uh, in, a, in a webinar. But let me turn to one of the other topics that Congressman Peters uh, discussed and that is in his bill with Senator Coons, which is border carbon adjustments. And I think this is something that, that clearly is a hardy perennial in the, in the carbon pricing debate. I remember long hours uh, put in uh, during the Waxman uh, Markey bill days working with labor, working with the affected industries around a border carbon adjustment system. I think it needs to be part of any serious carbon adjustment, uh, carbon pricing program going forward. But of course, it's complicated. Uh, it has international geopolitical uh, dimensions. And I'm wondering, uh, Christina, you, you, your organization has offices in India, in China, in Brazil. Uh, you're clearly in touch with the pulse in the developing countries. This has been a relatively uh, controversial provision uh, the European carbon border adjustment, uh, what's in the Coons-Peters bill, uh, what Canada is thinking about, uh, they see it as protectionist trade policy. They see it as a, as a way of trying to uh, hold back their economic development. And of course, that's not the intention. Uh -huh. But I'm just wondering what, what you see as the, as the way to address uh, those concerns. Is there some way to get uh, a meeting of the minds among not just the industrialized countries, but all the major uh, carbon emitting, carbon producing countries of the world on this issue? Well, um, in our support for a price on carbon, and we support many, 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 many other uh, uh, climate policies, we have never only supported that or mainly supported that, though we strongly support it. We've always recognized that um, protecting the competitiveness of the United States is going to be vitally important. So, um, how that is done precisely, like in Waxman Markey, which we were supportive of, it had the border adjustment tax. That seems like that would be a likely um, way forward on that. And I don't see politically how it could move without something like that. I do think there's lots of ways that you can design policies to uh, um, have less negative impact and more incentives for other countries in them. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, in part to be candid, because um, the person on our staff that's digging really deep in this with Katrina and others, I mean, like in the weeds of the weeds, is not me. 
but overall, um, you know, protecting U.S. competitiveness is a, a very important uh, policy priority. But I do think there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And the impacts uh, and how you design it will have a big impact on the impacts with um, developing countries. So I don't think it's a one size fits all sort of black and white. Um, you know, you always have to use a hammer. Great. And, and Marty, what's your take on the... Uh the border adjustment mechanism and the Coons Peters bill and what's the chamber's position on the need for a border carbon adjustment and any carbon pricing regime? Well, I think you know, clearly from our members, the feedback we've gotten from them, there's a, a great interest in the, in the border carbon adjustment. And as, and as uh, you know, Congressman Peters discussed, and I think Christina uh, alluded to it as well, I mean, we, we too believe that you know, it'd be a lot easier if you have an economy-wide price on carbon to be able to uh, have the accounting mechanism in place for, for the border adjustment. But uh, we do, while well, we support the concept, we've got members who are very interested in it for a lot of obvious reasons. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a lot of complexities to it. You know, at its core, the U.S. Chamber is a is a you know free trade organization, and we you know support the WTO you know rules that are out there. So again, there's a lot of those complexities that have to be dealt with. So while we're not we're not our message back to Senator Coons and, and Congressman Peters is not we're, we're not we're not trying to stall anything, but we do think we appreciate the opportunity to have some more give and take here to really dig into these challenges. Uh, and and as, as you noted earlier, some uh, you know, alignment with other international programs that are developing or may or may come out there as well. One of the uh, one of the issues that comes up on this, of course, and and one of my colleagues mentioned this in a in a question to Congressman Peters, is that no matter what we do here in the U.S. or in Europe or other developed countries, a growing share of emissions are in the major emerging economies, and actually we import a lot of carbon intensive products from those, those countries. So one of the questions is how do you design incentives into a system that not only will put up a barrier to their more carbon intensive products coming into our country, but give them incentives to actually decarbonize their supply chains, decarbonize their economies. And would uh, the panelists be open to a use of some portion of the revenues from a carbon pricing bill or a border carbon adjustment mechanism uh, to support developing countries make the transition to cleaner energy options. I'm on the advisory committee, have been for a decade or so of the German International Climate Initiative, and they use a significant share of their portion of the auction revenues from the emissions trading system uh, in, in Germany to support uh, developing country action, both on mitigation and adaptation. So what's the temperature on, on that, on sort of helping get to the root of the problem and, and really decarbonizing those countries. Maybe start with Jim and, and then I'll come to uh, Christina and Marty. Jim, what's your take on, on sort of the international uh, piece of this? Thanks, Alden. Well, I think um, as should be pretty obvious, um, the um, possibility of having a border carbon adjustment policy, a credible one and one that is internationally acceptable rests above all on having a robust set of climate policies at home that can give us the basis for arguing in favor of such an adjustment. And that includes, in my mind, um, a carbon price. Without a robust set of policies, we don't have a case for a border carbon adjustment, but certainly it should be part of the policy mix if and when we do. Um, I think from a standpoint of implementation, it's most tractable if the focus is on energy intensive trade exposed industries, as in the EU policy. It doesn't have to be on every single product in the world that we need to calculate the carbon content, but for certain um, activities, aluminum, cement, um, petroleum refining, et cetera, these are energy intensive, they're trade exposed, and those are the ones where really the action is gonna be in terms of border carbon adjustments. I think for international acceptability for developing countries as well as developed countries, a very useful thing ultimately will be to develop some sort of third party certification um, organization, which can uh, suggest the appropriate border carbon adjustments, looking at the carbon emissions associated with 
um, production in these various sectors around the world and can be seen as being arm's length from protectionist interests within countries implementing uh, the policy. Finally, with respect to developing countries, which I think is a very serious issue you raise, Alden, I think it is quite important that the policies with respect to those countries involve carrots as well as sticks. In fact, rely principally on carrots. Now, how those carrots should be financed is another question. Personally, I would rather see them financed by progressive taxation than out of carbon revenues. However, given that about 25% of US carbon emissions is from government expenditure, not consumer expenditure, um, there is a case for earmarking a certain chunk of the carbon revenues for government spending, and that could, in principle, include assistance to uh, developing countries, international assistance. So I would say on that front, I'm not um, opposed to earmarking a certain fraction of the revenues for it, as long as we retain enough, roughly 75%, to implement dividends for the American people out of the carbon revenue as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, Christina, what's your take on this uh, in terms of carrots, not just sticks in, in US carbon pricing policy for developing country action? Well, um, as you know, WRI is primarily an international organization. I work on the US piece, but that's not our primary focus. So we work in all of the biggest um, developing and, and emitting countries. And we are very actively supportive of international finance to help those countries develop and survive um, climate change and climate emissions impacts that they primarily haven't been responsible for creating, but more importantly, are really um, going to need a lot of assistance in um, supporting that. So I, um, I'm just going to take a leap here. I don't know that WRI has an exact policy, but I would find it pretty hard to believe if we win support some of that revenue going in that direction, because we work a great deal in international finance exactly on the issue of trying to help um, the largest developing countries develop in uh, low carbon, sustainable ways for them. Thanks, Christina. And, and Marty, what's the chamber's take on this uh, this question? Well, just briefly, I, mean, I would say, and, and somewhat echoing what Christina was saying, if we, if we want the developing world to be part of the solution here, and then this is a, a global a global problem, we know that one of the major challenges they you know they face is financing, you know, for uh, for. Uh, uh, being able to take the steps necessary. So it's conceptually, I think we would be supportive, but uh, you know, without uh, pinning us down to a specific uh, proposal here, I think it's definitely something that should be on the table. Great. Before I turn it over to Tom, let me just ask each of you a closing question, which is given uh, where you stand, what you know now, what you heard from Congressman Peters, uh, what's your prognostication of where we end up by the end of the year? on this? Uh, do we have uh, carbon pricing as part of reconciliation? Do we have a reconciliation bill? And put aside your preferences, whether you'd like one or not, uh, just reading the tea leaves and, and from what you know, uh, where, where do you stand? And I'll go in a reverse order. Uh, Jim, we'll start with you as the, uh, the outsider up in Amherst. Well, I'll, I'll defer to the, um, to the closer uh, look that uh, the folks in DC can provide on that. But, but one thing I would, would add that's happened this year already and is continuing to happen is that I think the facts on the ground are changing. More and more people are realizing that climate change is real. Uh, that it's happening here and now. It's not just an issue affecting future generations. And especially more and more young people are tuned in to that reality. And so those changing facts on the ground, I think, are what really lays the basis for ultimately changes in the breadth and depth of support for robust climate policy. So by the end of the year, I mean, by no means do I want to disparage all the efforts that, that uh, groups in Washington have made to move carbon policy forward in the in the very difficult environment of the last decade. I think that's all super valuable and I I thank everyone who's worked on doing this. But I think um, we need to look uh, again uh, beyond what we do or don't manage to accomplish in any given year to how things are changing uh, more broadly over time, and how we can leverage those changes in order to put in place uh, a robust climate policy, including a robust climate, uh, carbon price. 
Thanks, Jim. Marty, what's your take on where you think we're going to end up in at the end of this uh, this session of Congress? Well, I'm I'm going to answer by saying that you know my hope is that we can find a way of using the model of the of, of the bipartisan infrastructure bill that allowed us to get to you know a, you know significant uh, uh, progress here, and that uh, including discussion of pricing on carbon and other climate policies that we know we, that we know we need. But uh, again, I think we, we we need to find a way to do that outside of reconciliation. Okay. And uh, Christina, last word. Well, um, I I always feel like I, I feel mixed. I'm an optimistic person, as gen in general. And in that realm, I know this is what the American people want. Period. That is so clear. But I also know that our structure of government has some big flaws in it, which we won't go into here. But just that. Uh, the Senate doesn't really represent the people and, um, you know, lobbying by corporate and other interests are much more powerful than other things on the table. So um, I guess I would close with that I'm cautiously optimistic, but I have been um, decimated so many times by Congress, I can't tell you that um, I think people in my office would say that I'm an optimistic person and tend to be sort of pessimistic when it comes to Congress. And that may just be trying to protect additional PTSD and other things um, from, you know, wax monarchy failures and other opportunities that we've had. So I'm going to I'm going to put myself in the I'm going to keep hoping, but um, we all need to do all we can to push this forward because I don't think we're going to have another opportunity in the time frame that this um, challenge needs to be met at scale. Well, thank you very much. I totally associate myself with those remarks. I also am a congenital optimist, uh, but it's a pretty tough road to hoe uh, that we're looking at right now, but we don't have any more time left. So let me leave it there. Thank all three of you. Thank uh, Katrina and Congressman thank Peters you. for a great uh, session today. And uh, let me turn it over to Tom to uh, close us out and say what might be coming next. Thank you very much, Alden. And uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Peters, uh, Marty, Christina, Jim. And uh, thank you, Nat, for hosting uh, and all the crew at C2ES. This is our second uh, public forum we've had with C2ES. Um, as Nat said at the beginning, uh, you've been part of our group for 10 years, very instrumental. And uh, we're just wonderful to have you as our virtual host. 